Hi, good morning. Welcome to uh, Phil Scottish coming to you live from the basement of the Yes Bar. I'd like to welcome back this week Michelle Rogers, who was unfortunately ill last week. How are you feeling, Michelle? Yeah. Much better. Okay. Glad to be back, actually. Excellent. Um, Glad to have you back. We've got a cracking lineup as ever for you this week. Um, joining us on the newspaper review is Susan Egelstaff. Susan's a sports journalist and also a London 2012 Olympian. And we've got Marianne Taylor, who's a freelance journalist, formerly of BBC and The Guardian. Um, she now writes features, columns and leaders for The Herald, The Sunday Herald and The Evening Times. Martin Crewe is director of Bernardo's in Scotland. He's coming on to talk to us about the named persons. Um, I wasn't here for the conversation that you had last week. It was a bit of a conversation during the newspaper yeah. review. Provoked a lot of interest, so we've invited Martin on to, to talk to us about that today. We've also got Greg Russell, who is a journalist with The National, and he's been following and indeed leading the field with the story of the brain family who are facing deportation. We've also got Michael Gray from Common Space. He has an exclusive story about uh, Edward Snowden leaks, and uh, apparently it's, uh, there's a secret Scottish spy system that we're going to hear all about. And indeed, we cannot talk, not talk about Brexit with the European referendum coming fast upon us. Um, it's still top of, of the agenda today. Um, so we're joined today by Colin Fox, who's National co spokesperson of the Scottish uh, Socialist Party, a former MSP for the Lothians. And We've got David Pratt, a regular foreign correspondent, here to give us his perspective on the international news making the headlines this week. So, without further ado, let's uh, launch into the newspaper review, the front pages, um, Europe's everywhere, and indeed so is the uh, certain football match in the Euros yesterday, mm -hmm. which was uh, problematic, shall we say. Yes, and also uh, a certain old woman's birthday. Oh yeah, for that. Um, Sunday Telegraph, PM's Brexit um, pensions warning. Indeed, uh, same story is uh, front page of the Observer, which is uh, Cameron warning that the axe could fall on state pensions after Brexit. Project Fear, who said that? The Mail on Sunday is telling us that uh, we have to stop dieting. Good news for some of us. Yeah, I love that story. <laughs> um, Sunday Times has got a big thing about uh, Boris, blonde ambition, and a story secret talks on Turkish travel to the UK. Today's Sunday Herald, Euro Trash. More savaging of politicians involved in the in the Brexit campaign. Indeed, and what's more, that can't now fine. Um, <laughs> however, we have an outrage. Uh, we have an outrage, uh, which, which leads is us into uh, our uh, our first uh, topic of conversation for today, Susan. You were going to kick us off on the uh, the football stories that yeah. have been across the pages this week. Yeah, the fighting has started remarkably quickly within 24 hours of the tournament starting. But yeah. I think the coverage has been interesting. You know, they've been. I mean, the English fans have been really right in the middle of this fight in Marseille, and the papers have been really soft on them today in comparison to the coverage on social media, which mm -hmm. really shows some quite like outrageous behaviour. And I mean, I think, you know, the in the stadium last night, I think the Russian fans maybe targeted the English fans, but I think out in Marseille, the English fans have been guilty. And you know, it's it's amazing how soft the papers have been, especially with social media. You know, you can't get away with that. You know, people I think know the truth and. I think it's interesting how soft the papers are being the English fans and always trying to kind of make excuses for them. Mm. Maya, and you've been looking at social media, you've been seeing what's going on there? Yeah, there's been some pretty awful things obviously happening. I think it's quite interesting to see English fans in a place like Marseille. I was there last year. It's a, it's a really interesting place. It's very unlike the north of France, for example. It's a very Islamic city as well, but it's also the home of the French right too. So it's a place with a number of tinder boxes in some ways for England fans and it seems that they are absolutely way having having the time of their lives out there, a few of them. But it, it, it's an interesting time too with, with Brexit, mm -hmm. just uh, well with the EU referendum just a few days away and uh, yeah there's there's a number of red rags and a number of bills and it's it's interesting to see who's fallen for what. David, are we not just like celebrating bad behaviour in English fans because we're not there? There's an element of that. I mean, I know you and I share a passionate interest in football. A passionate, course, <laughs> uh, I've got a passionate I mean, disinterest in football. Well, well I, 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 the football, I don't really follow that much either, it has to be said. Although, in major championships like this, I, I do find myself getting a wee bit sort of embroiled and, and, and interested because obviously it's a, it's a cut above your average, your average kind of level of, of football, one would hope. It's obviously a cut above your average level of trouble as well. There's no question about that. I mean, I, I think the thing that strikes me more than anything is, as Susan was saying, I mean, it, it's just, 
it's easy, I think, as a Scot, you know, inevitably there's going to be people sitting around the breakfast tables today or in the pub later on saying, you know, oh, well, you know, I mean, inevitably, you know, the, 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 the English or the British press has gone easy on English fans, you know. But frankly, they have. If you actually look at today's titles, um, it's very toned down. You know, it's it's wing columns, it's, it's basement stuff. There's one or two, admittedly, there are one or two front page pictures. But the general pitch, the general feel is that somehow they're victims. You know, they're not equals in terms of what's been going on mm. here. And there's no question that, you know, all violence, I mean, all that football violence, I mean, I loathe it like most people. It's absolutely horrendous. It's an embarrassment. You know, it, I feel for the people in, in Marseille themselves who have to put up with this nonsense, you know. And, you know, the Russians are, are, are equally to blame. But I do think today's press coverage, and that's after all what we're, we're focusing mm. on here, has gone very, very easy on England fans. Mm. I mean, I, I, I'm hoping to get through the whole tournament without watching a single minute of football. That's my ambition. Um, <laughs> but I guess I will be paying more attention to the European referendum, which is all over the papers today it is, too. It is. We were talking a lot about that up the stairs, Marianne. I think you had uh, a couple of yeah, well, I mean, about. it's a week on Thursday, which means it's uh, it's only a few days away and things are extremely intense. They're much closer than a lot of us maybe thought they would be at this point. And things for the last week or two have been getting extremely dirty, deep down and dirty. And it's interesting, uh, at this juncture, we see um, that uh, Axe, Axe Could Fall, this is the Remain side with their latest uh, latest scare story, which is Axe, Axe Could Fall on, on, on pensions. If I remember, um, it, it's more or less this story is just a rerun of what we saw at pretty much the same juncture <coughs> in the independence refer uh, referendum, but also it's aimed at obviously, you know, prime, you know, Brexiteer territory, which is older English voters. So it might have an impact. It may do. Um, the Observer has also has a quite an interesting interview with with the Prime Minister. It's crunch time for him, of course, as well. And I think across the newspapers, we're now seeing a wee bit more about what might happen afterwards. We're starting to already yeah. think about what might happen afterwards. Although, as I've just said, the actual result we genuinely don't know, and I'm not sure that many of us thought this would happen. Obviously, I think if if it is a Brexit. It's the end for Cameron. There's no doubt about that. Um, he was lucky, and he's he's a, an interesting prime minister that he seems to think it's okay to call two ref to allow two referendums. He's brave in some ways to allow two. He his luck was with him on the last one. Will his luck stick for another one? I don't know. It will be interesting to see. I don't know what everyone else thinks about that. Susan, were you? expecting it to be this close. Right now the polls suggest actually that it's not that close and that it's quite clearly going to be a vote to leave. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think anybody thought it was going to be this close, but I mean, I think also the referendum told us that, or, and especially the general election, that how much can you trust the polls? You know, and I think, you know, a lot of kind of recent elections, there was a kind of secret no voters, there was a secret conservative voters at the general election. You know, I think that it'll be interesting to see if that happens again this time you know and if there's a lot of people you know it's the leave people that are more kind of are louder are a bit more passionate about it but actually the main voters will come out the woodwork without having you know made too much of a kind of stushy about what their vote was going to be and it will end up being a remain vote like everyone kind of thought it would be i think maybe six months or a year ago but i mean i think nobody really knows what to believe anymore you know both sides are just shouting lies at each other you mm -hmm. know and I think most kind of, in inverted commas, normal people don't really know what to believe anymore. And I think, I mean, certainly for people who are not kind of really like embroiled in politics, I think it's just boring now. Mm. You know. David, do you? Well, I mean, I, I think that that's. I mean, I know we'll be talking a bit more about you know the, the politics yeah. of it later. So you know, I'm trying to kind of keep my, my observations to, to the way the papers have actually yeah. dealt with it. And, and and I think the papers today, you know, as they have been over the last few weeks, every week now, you know particularly on the Sunday papers, you know, we've got, well, what's the latest scare story? You know, what's the latest one? You can almost anticipate that there will be a scare story on the front of the papers um, come Sunday. You know, and, and this weekend's no different. It's just an awful lot of heat and very little light, you know, and, and, and I think that's a huge problem. In, in some ways, I think a lot of the newspapers have done themselves a considerable disservice, you know. 
there are exceptions to that, but most of them I haven't really, I think, managed to get beneath the surface of the arguments very well. They've been kind of knee-jerk responses within the papers to whatever the latest scare story is. You know, and, and, and for that reason, I think many people, ordinary people, are confused about it now because they just hear this echo chamber from both ends, you know, in terms of my scare story, my scare story. Mm -hmm. And it's become a kind of clamour of that at the moment rather than actually anything really interesting in terms of proper analysis, you know, that casts light on it. I think it's interesting too though that the Remain campaign have chosen to say it's all about economics, the Leave campaign have chosen to say it's all about immigration. immigration. Mm -hmm. And for those of us that are interested in Europe and you're interested in the whole idea of Europe, I think what's been so sad is that there's been no opportunity to talk about any of the wider uh, cultural links we have or that we wouldn't want to have or that the wider things that would make many of us want to stay there's been no opportunity to talk about that to the idea of Europe what it means to all of us I spent time working out in Germany and that was an amazing insight into what they think the idea of Europe is and it's very attractive in many ways there's been no discussion of that at all what I would also say interestingly is that and I've written you previously on this I think the English have the, have the balls, if you like, you know, to vote out. It would appear last uh, in you know 2014 we were maybe lacking in that a wee bit. I think they have the balls to do it, and it will be interesting to see whether it actually comes to pass. Okay, we'll talk more about Europe in later in the programme. Um, however, uh, another thing that is all over the front pages of the newspapers today uh, is Queen Sun Queen's 90th birthday. birthday. Mm. Yeah. Three days of celebrations. Indeed. Um, Pomp and pageantry at its It's been fantastic. Worst. Yes, absolutely. And it's been, <laughs> it's been great to see as well how Scotland has absolutely got into the swing of things. Oh, um, you're talking about the hashtag, aren't you? I am <laughs> talking, about, I'm talking about the hashtag. The Scottish Street Party yes. hashtag. Yeah. Um, which is, is hilarious. If you haven't already, you must go onto Twitter and have a look at this. Um, it basically is empty, empty, empty streets. streets. <laughs> tumbleweed, a lone cigarette. <laughs> sitting. Su Susan, have you been toasting her madge? Um, don't know if you'd quite say that. <laughs> okay. I've been spending a lot of time looking through Scottish Street Party hashtag. Yes. I'll probably be spending more time doing that than toasting her. I mean, it's just... It's quite amazing the difference in opinion in Scotland and England, doesn't it? You know, like the English love all this, or a lot of them love the whole kind of royalty and, you know, think they're all brilliant in the Scotland. Pretty much everyone's not bothered. Yeah, it's not that it's anti royal, I don't think, particularly. It's just that, well, it's like, mm, who cares? Yeah, yeah, I think that, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't hate the royal family, but I've got no kind of particular admiration for someone who's born into it. You know, yeah. like, well done, you were born into the royal family. Yeah. Like, so, I think, yeah, but I think, yeah, it's pretty funny how Scottish people manage to put that take on it. <laughs> Although, the, I mean, the, the, the today's, or yesterday's, uh, celebrations followed hard on the heels of the Queen's birthday honours list, which saw, you know, rock and roll rebels like Rod Stewart taking that. I think you could use that word rebel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think actually now the words rock and roll and the word rebel should yeah. never be said in the same <laughs> sentence Indeed. because not one of them has ever, you know, basically lived up to the hype and we were, they were supposed to be conducting a countercultural revolution in the 60s and now they're queuing up to take awards. So, I don't know, I'm, I'm bailing out the rock you and roll. you had yours back, right? <laughs> Well, I don't know. Um, no, I'm, suggest I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting for a moment that there's one coming your way. I, ha I, haven't, I haven't got one. I don't think I'll ever get. I'll get one. I but like the Beatles. I guess I like the Beatles mm. attitude to it. And then you go to the toilets of Buckingham Palace and smoke some hash, and then you you <laughs> hand you hand the thing or back. Or you behave like the former presiding officer Trisha Marwick and just decline it. Actually, you know what? That place. is that is absolutely the most we honourable said, thing heroin, to do. Heroin, heroin of the week. Heroin, heroin of the week. Yeah. Um, and I guess hero or potentially would be hero of the week, John Swinney, trying to wade into the educational mm -hmm. debate and trying to close the attainment gap, which Nicola Sturgeon said is the thing that she will be judged by. Um, that is a hard thing to pull off. My I think it's, it's a really hard job, but I suppose he's the man for it in many ways. He's, he's proved himself, I think, over a long, a long time to be fairly reliable, but also when it needs to be to be able to make the, the friends he needs to make, but also be hard as well. I think this will we'll look back and see this is the re this is the main 
thing for this entire, the main issue for this entire administration. And the SNP really need to make progress on this. They need to be seen to make progress. But I think the fact that, that, that John Swinney's in charge shows that they want to make that progress. Um, we're, we're seeing now... He's not had an easy ride with the teachers, though. I mean, the, the, the teaching no. unions, obviously, were, were clearly giving him a bit of a hard they're time. Yeah. Well, they're threatening a strike. Mm. Mm. It's, it's an interesting point, isn't it? It's, it will be hard to make progress at a time where there's a, a whole new exam system, which isn't hugely popular with many yeah. of those who are, are there to actually teach it. They're, they're saying that the resources aren't there as well. Um, so at that time, they want to see huge improvements in the exam, exam performance. I think it will be very hard for them. But I also think they need to look a wee bit wider. They need to look at places like London that have been able to make progress for the very, very poorest um, over quite a short amount of time. Now, the English, of the English education system is very, very different. You know, but I think we need to maybe look a wee bit wider and not accept full scale everything that their system has. But we need to look at those aspects that, that, that we may be able to learn from because this is such a hard nut, you know, to crack. The, the whole idea of what is fair and what is unfair is hard, but we do know that for those at, at, at our very, very poorest children, they are eons behind our wealthiest children. How do you make a difference? I don't know. Susan, people have been talking about this for decades, uh, and I think the gap is, has grown, I think it's fair to say, rather than now. <coughs> um, and there was, I think there were some figures this week, earlier on last week which suggested the number of uh, over 18s um, from deprived areas, the areas going to universities was dropping. What, what's, what's, um, yeah, what's the answer? Could you, <laughs> well, could you solve all you that? Could you solve all that? <laughs> I mean, it is it's so hard and... Um, I mean, occasionally I go into schools to do little kind of talks to kids about, you know, kind of about sport and like motivation and stuff. And I was in a school in Bishaw during the week and the teacher was saying she's really worried about the summer holidays coming up because she knows, and this is first year kids, she knows that a lot of the kids will come back a stone lighter because, you know, they're just being kind of neglected over the summer. And so it's so hard to say that this is just a problem with the schools and the teachers and the education system because I don't think that one thing will ever solve you know, or close the gap because there's kind of so many factors that go into it and go into, you know, kids not being as well educated as kids who are from kind of more affluent areas, you know, like, then I've also gone into schools from kids, uh, and I speak to kids with more, from more affluent areas and, you know, they're all sporty, they all know about diet, they all know about, you know, all the kind of, those type of things that help you get a good education and help you move on to university and help you get a good job. So I think, I mean, Clearly there's no obvious answer or someone would have found it by now and I think, you know, a lot of it is, I think, I think educating parents as well mm. and, you know, even just simple things like get kids to eat breakfast, mm. you know, and then they'll be able to concentrate better in their classes and stuff and probably sounds like a really silly thing but it's maybe the tiny little things that will maybe, hopefully, you know, add up to a bigger difference. I mean, there's no easy answer but, I mean, certainly in terms of the educational structure and stuff like that, I mean, you can't tinker with it. I mean, something as profoundly important as this, you know, as this this gap widens, needs some really radical and, and, and kind of revolutionary overhaul. You know, and, and inevitably, when anyone engages in that, you're going to put noses out joint, and I think that's already happening. But that shouldn't, I think, be a deterrent from actually trying to get right into the nuts and bolts and rejig the system in a way that is far, far more fair. In that mm -hmm. way. It's not a uniquely Scottish or British phenomenon. I, mean, I was reading during the week that in the United States, the I mean, there's a massive gap yeah. in the United States as well at, at, at school level. I think as well, one of the kind of disappointing aspects of the whole debate is the way that it's often used as political points going. In the mm -hmm. Daily Mail, sorry, Mail on Sunday today, there's a, a column by the Conservative Education Spokesman in Scotland, which the headline says why John Swinney's fail, failing and if you read the column, the column actually says that his, his new initiative to concentrate on the three R's is actually in, in praise of it, and, and yet yeah. says that 
Um, the problem is that the SNP's record is, is, according to the spokesperson, not not praiseworthy. Well, Johnson is well, only you're doing damned if you, you're damned if you're doing, you're damned if you don't. Yeah, exactly. In the eyes of these people, you know, and and it is it does require such an overhaul that you know that inevitably people will be against it. But you've got to start somewhere. You've got Absolutely. to really grasp the nettle on this, and you know and you can't fall. I think so, Nina, for, for for doing so. Uh -huh. you know. I think one of the other stories yeah, you saw. Yeah, we were talking about earlier the, the Stanford rapist story. Mm. Um, a young woman sexually assaulted um, after a party. Uh, she was unconscious when she was sexually assaulted. She was rescued by two Swedes on bicycles who chased after her rapist. And I think what has shocked people is the fact that this young, bright, athletic guy um, was given six months jail sentence for which he served three. Mm -hmm. um, despite the horrific attack and the the blaming of what he did, not accepting responsibility, the responsibility for himself, but saying, "Well, it's it's the drink culture at university." What, what do you what do you Susan read into? What do you take from the sentencing? What kind of message do you think the judge is sending? Out? It's shocking, and there's you know there've been quite a lot of issues about campus rape and ca like sexual assault on campus in America, and I mean it almost says. Well, it's okay, especially if you know you're you're white, you know you're kind of that kind of all American look. You'll probably get off leniently, and you know the um, the judge was Stanford educated as well. You wonder if that's getting thing, you know, if he almost sympathised with the mm -hmm. the boy at all. And I mean, the petition to recall the judge and you know get the sentence kind of looked at again has got over a million signatures. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if that will make any difference. But it's shocking that I mean he could have got 14 years and he got six months, mm -hmm. and as you say, we'll serve three. A well, it's a similar glaring example of a kind of inequity. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and you know, the American press has been full of it since since the, the case came to light. You know, in the last week or so, they've been giving examples of similar cases where perhaps a, a black man was involved mm -hmm. in the sentencing that was applied or someone from, you know, a, a lower class or whatever has been, you know, been sentenced for, for, for that, that sort of uh, offence. You know, so it, it's just exposed yet again how the two-tier system operates, particularly in the United States over this, you know. But, but I think it also tells us, you're talking about the kind of campus culture. Again, it's not unique to the United States. You switch it the other way around here. I mean, I think annually now, particularly during Freshers Week, you'll find that the National Union of Students and whatever are, are constantly putting out warnings about the dangers, you know, overindulgence and, and, and the kinds of shenanigans that go on that can lead to very, very serious offences like this. So it, it seems to be something that's... A, I'm not suggesting for a moment that students in a bygone age didn't behave crazily during Freshers' Week, but there does seem to be a kind of culture around now where these things are, you know, dangerous, I think, in many respects. I suppose, but alcohol doesn't make you a rapist. No. no. So, um, and I think what, what struck me about the, the story this week was the, the boy's father, who was didn't acknowledge any responsibility, there was no apology to the victim, and said that he was being treated harshly for 20 minutes of action, mm. which is appalling. A, a number, as, a number as a of parent, the calmness, sorry. You know, as a parent to, yeah, yeah. to defend behaviour like that, I think is, I, I wouldn't as a parent, I have to say. I think it's a lot of the calmness I've talked about, the role of the father's father and his the letter. The the Sunday Mail. Yeah, the Sun, Sunday yeah. Mail and Patel are very, very, very strong. Very strong. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I've got a, a difficult, I, I think parents will do sometimes almost anything to protect their children. Mm -hmm. I think the problem for me isn't so much what the father did, Although I would argue, absolutely, his views were reprehensible. The problem is the judge paying any attention to it. I mean, yeah. if, if you're going to go to get a, a reasoned view of anything, the last person you're going to go to is the guy's father. It's, it's crazy you should just discount that completely. Although I think it's not only the father that's been, you know, almost saying, well, you know, he's a promising swimmer, you know, he's a good student. It makes yeah, no difference. Absolutely. You know, if you're a rapist, you're a rapist. Yeah. It doesn't matter what your prospects are. There's been far less coverage of the impact it's had on the victim. Although her, you know, until her, her testimony. Her letter, yeah, once was her letter incredible. was published on BuzzFeed, I think that brought attention to it. But until her letter was published, it was all commentary on how this would affect the boy's life. Yeah. Mm. It is. It's, it's a strange yeah. way of looking yeah. at looking I think at maybe we also have to look, though. It shows us that um, rape, although rape is rape, um, 
throughout all society, we think that there's rape that happens when women are on the streets and they're the you know, stranger. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. then there's rape of this sort that, if we're absolutely honest, we're obviously not treating it as the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it also makes me think, I remember, you know, growing up in the 80s and, and, and the 90s and all the emphasis was on me as a young woman, you have to be careful, you need to mm -hmm. not wear this, you yeah. need to not drink yeah. too much, you need to make sure that you get home okay. All the em emphasis was on women, whereas now I'm glad to see at least there is a slight change in that and there's more emphasis on maybe having a chat to young men and saying you need to know what consent means. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And although it's hard to educate people on these things, it's no bad thing to have a go and to move the emphasis maybe away from women onto men. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. yeah. I, I still think though there is still there's a lot of victim blaming and there's a lot of like yeah. mm -hmm. how like, kind of as you say like how to teach people not to be raped rather than teach Absolutely. people not, not to rape. rape. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. 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 I agree with that. Another one of the stories um, was about the sort of fallout from rendition flights, David, and the lack of prosecutions which are liable to follow that. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, just to recap on it, obviously, earlier in the week, you know, there was a decision by the, the, the Crown Prosecution Service that there was insufficient evidence to charge or convict any British intelligence officer or indeed any British politician with the, the rendition of Libyans, uh, particularly two Libyans, Abdul Hakim Belhaj and, and uh, Sami Al Sadi, um, if you remember, who were spirited from Asia via the CIA's sort of black prisons to uh, an infamous prison in, in Tripoli, which I visited when, when uh, Gaddafi was overthrown, called Abu Salim, where they were tortured and rendered. Now, of course, the key figure in all of this is, is uh, a chap called Sir Mark Allen, who at one point was almost um, tipped to be the new head of MI6 before John, John Scarlett got the job. As a matter of fact, interestingly, a little note, a little side note, um, which I mentioned in my piece today, um, I, I met Sir Mark Allen actually at the Wigton Book Festival many years ago because he wrote a fantastically definitive book on the Arabs, just called the Arabs. He's one of Britain's um, amazing Arabists. Little did I know that some years later that I would be one of the first journalists into Abu Salim prison and meet prisoners that had been held there and had been tortured. And that inextricable link between Abu Salim and Sir Mark Allen, the man that I met on a quiet afternoon at the Wigton Book Festival, which is quite curious. But the real issue about this story is the fact that, effectively, everyone has gone and walked scot-free. I mean, reprieve, the human rights groups are absolutely appalled by what has happened here. There's no question that Balhaj, the families, I mean, remember, it wasn't just the two individuals. Their families were taken with them as well. Um, they were tortured, they were rendered, and they walked free on this. And, and some of the eyewitness testimonies of people that were being tortured said that British officials were... Oh, were well, yeah, I mean... I mean uh, Balahaj and, and Hadi himself have said that uh, you know that the first people to interrogate them at Abbasilim were, were British intelligence officials. The most damning piece of evidence, of course, is a letter which was found amongst many documents when in bombed out buildings when Gaddafi was overthrown at the security headquarters, in which Sir Mark Allen actually says uh, it's to his sort of intelligence counterpart, uh, Musa Kusa, who's the head of the Libyan intelligence, saying, um, I'm glad that, you know, the kind of cargo arrived and everything's fine and, you know, it's the least we could do for you in terms of our special relationship. You've got to remember that all this is against the backdrop of Tony Blair's deal in the desert at that time, you know. So, you know, we've had an investigation, a couple of years, Scotland Yard, Crown Prosecution Service, and everyone just seems to walk free. And, of course, the old... Um, characters are still there. Jack Straw, who was heading up as Foreign Secretary at the time, said he didn't know anything about it. And of course, Tony Blair said he had no recollection of it whatsoever. But then Tony Blair seems to have a very selective memory when it comes to certain aspects of foreign affairs. Indeed, and we'll see what Chilcot says when it is published. Uh, next when month. it's next published, month, yes. yes. When it's published. Well, next early month, July, next, next month, early date, July yeah. 16th, yeah. rings a bell. Thank you. That was, that was really good. Yes. Great. Um, now we would like to welcome Martin Crew to join us. Martin is the director of um, children's charity Bernardo's uh, and one of a number of charities who is, which is supportive of the named persons legislation. Obviously there's been a lot of controversy about that. Um, what do you think it is about the named persons legislation that has frightened people so much? I think what's frightened people mainly is the scare stories that are going around. <clears throat> One of the things that's really disappointing is that um, when all the major children's charities, all the uh, basic statutory bodies 
are supportive of this as a step in the right direction, that a relatively small group of people have managed to scare a lot of parents about what it's about. And I think the, um, the belief is that somehow new state guardians are going to step in and tread on the toes of families, and that, that's just not the case. There is so much need out there that, that the state is not going to get involved with mainly middle-class parents who are the ones who are complaining about it. Although abuse happens in middle-class homes yep. in the same way that happens in any other strata of society. Yep. Um, and so it's a difficult balance well, to strike, isn't it, to say, well, wait a minute, you, yes, we're not going to be stepping on your toes, but it doesn't mean to say that you can get away with yeah, and I think that that's a fair point, and it, it's a useful clarification because named person is not about child protection and abuse at that end. The the conflation of the the Liam Fee case with the named person I thought was absolutely terrible because it has nothing to do with it. Named person is the first point of contact when somebody needs a bit of extra support. It's not about child protection. By the time it's gone to social work, it's escalated way beyond that. And I mean, I, I can give a couple of examples of what the name person is, as opposed to... Well, okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, these are real cases. There was a, a four-year-old girl who was coming to nursery, and she was brought by her dad. She was well turned out. There were no concerns at all. Uh, a few weeks later, she was turning up at nursery more erratically, different people bringing her, dishevelled, not so happy. That wasn't a child protection concern, that was a well-being concern. So when it was raised and said, well, what's going on in this, this little girl's life, what happened was that the parents had split up. The mum had multiple sclerosis, and suddenly the, the, the dad was off the scene, and a family who'd been holding it together no longer were. Now, that, that's why you have named person. Another example is... Sorry, before you go on to that example, so what happened after that to rectify the situation? Well, then, then support was brought in because okay. that, that little girl needed support. It, 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 it wasn't it be, about snooping into the family. No. But would it be the case, I don't know clearly this particular case, but I, could, I would imagine that it's possible that the mother in that case might have thought, I don't want to go to, for help in case somebody decides yeah. to take my children or child yeah. away. Yeah. Is that, how do you get around that fear? Well, and, and that's what I think some of this rhetoric is, is adding to. What, what we have to get to a position is that families understand that the number of, the number of children taken into care is actually tiny. Um, if you're looking at the number of children who have significant needs and support needs, it's about one in five in Scotland from, from big population surveys. Kids who've got lots going on in their lives who need support. <clears throat> the number who actually go on to child protection registers or are taken into care is less than 2%, so 1 in 50 at most. So it, the, the, there's, a, there's a very big difference between those who need additional support and those who are, are potentially going to be taken into care. Okay. You mentioned you had another example, I interrupted yeah. you, sorry about that. Yeah, the, I mean the, the other example was a 12 year old girl who, who um, the police picked up for being drunk in a city centre with a group of friends. And that was obviously a concern. They took her home. In uh, previous times, what would probably happen would be that that was reported to the children's reporter. There would be a whole series of statutory interventions because the system said you should. What happened was that the police informed the named person and said, actually, the, the parents were, were horrified. They spoke to their girl. It seemed to be a one-off occasion. The named person looked at at the situation, there were no other concerns going on in that girl's life. It seemed to be a one-off. It was it, it was monitored for a, a, another few weeks. Nothing else happened. So actually, social work were not informed. It didn't go anywhere else. It didn't go to the children's reporter. A named person resulted in less state intervention than you would have had. And those sorts of examples are, are just as important as the ones where you spot things and it gets escalated. So what? Is it that is? I can see what people, why people are uneasy, but mm. why is nobody telling them the stuff that you've just been telling us today? Well, I think we are, but I think um, that learning from what's actually happened is that I think uh, ourselves and other agencies probably felt that we we had the the right of the argument on our side, and that people would come round to that. 
but there has been a whole series of, of scare stories um, from basically groups who don't think the state should have any role in families at all. And when you've got that going on, your average parent is going to be concerned. They are going to be thinking, well, what, what's going to change here? Because, no, you know, I'm a parent myself. Nobody parents perfectly. But we've got to get some sense of what the threshold here is. There's got to be a significant <coughs> level of concern for named person to be interested in your case. Well, when you're in the media, I, mean, I, I don't know when the Liam Fee case was being reported, it's, there is such hysteria around it, for good reason, because people say something must be done for good reason. It's kind of hard to separate those two things. Absolutely. Um, your, role, your role as a journalist, you're not able to just ignore all these other groups. Mm. That's the thing. I know that you may wish to do that, but as, as, as a journalist, you're not able to ignore them. You, you have to listen to all the voices. And it can be frustrating, even as a journalist, that you know that you have to react react to something that you know probably isn't the crux of something, but it is your job, you know, you know, to try to and react it. to it. And what you, I suppose, have to try to do is look around it and bring in as many as many voices. I mean, it is very interesting because the Liam Fee case, as you say, it just brought a whole new element into the whole named person um, thing. And I think it's been an interesting one for the SNP. <laughs> I mean, is this the thing that they absolutely want to die in a ditch over? I don't know whether, or it, I think it seems to have really, really got out of hand for them. How what important does is it? Think how important? That? How important is it for charities? Um, the, the, this, the this legislation goes through. We saw the toys try to derail it last mm. week. Didn't work. Um, even for children's charities, it is probably not the most important thing that's going on. That's right. interesting. You know, we mm. we. We believe it's the right thing to do, which is why we've been public in our support for it. But if, uh, if the legislation was paused or changed or whatever, I think the key question to ask the, the, the critics is, so what would you do instead? Mm -hmm. you know, we have an imperfect system now. We're trying to introduce a system that is somewhat better. There will still be mistakes. Children will still die. It, it's a, a very risky business. Susan, when you're, when you're reading that in the media, when you're seeing, when you're, when you're seeing the furore about name person, are there any ease about it? You, is there any part of that that hits a, a chord with you? Yeah, I mean, it is. I think, as you say, it's, it's hard to really kind of get out of the stories what is actually the important facts. And I think, for me, the biggest thing that it looks like is it's really been, it's been very badly marketed. You know, because nobody actually really knows what the main point of it is. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because the SNP in some things are very good at kind of getting their message across, but I think on this they've done a really poor job at it. And I think it has been so clouded by the kind of Liam Fee story mm -hmm. and, you know, there's been a lot of things that are not necessarily relevant to the story that have been kind of brought in. And I think, yeah, I mean, I'm, if they could start again, I'm sure they would be delighted to start again because, as you say, like, now it's kind of gone so far that actually it's quite hard to pull it back and get back to the facts. It's not... Oh, sorry, I was going to say, but it is actually working in place yeah, in yeah. parts of the country at the yeah, moment. Yeah, I mean, in, in Highland, it's been in place for so long that they don't even talk about it. It's just the way they work, you, you know. Um, and I think, you know, we've seen some really good, strong results there where it's been bedded in the most. The, the, the number of reports to the children's reporter has gone down. The, the social work... Um, people far from being distracted by it have actually got more time to spend on on the cases that matter so it, it has been a success there and in other parts of the country it's been rolled out at different speeds and we're seeing successes across the board I think one of the key messages is that for the vast majority of parents this will make no difference whatsoever mm -hmm. you know, do you think it, they should have been called something different well the, the, the irony is that named person was actually what came from Highland parents when they were first consulted on what would help. And somebody mm. said, what would really help would be a named person who I could go to who would coordinate the support I need. David, is that, politically, it's, it's a difficult one. It, it's immensely difficult, but I, I'm, I'm always in favour. It's interesting what Martin's saying about you know, the charities being behind us. I, mean, I'm, I understand the concerns of parents about state intervention and things like that, and you know, that, that has to be very carefully monitored as well. 
But I'm a big believer that you know that you, you have to rely on the professionals here and the people that actually understand this. And from what you're saying, you know, most children's charities and whatever are, are behind this, you know, and, and they're presented with sufficient evidence that to, to, to suggest that it, that it works and it's very effective, you know. And, and for me, that is the starting point. I, I mean, you've got to remember, you're talking about some of the most vulnerable people in our mm -hmm. society, you know, and, and with all its imperfections, as you say, I'd rather have some system there that at least the professionals recognise and they see as valuable than a lot of quibbling about, you know, this. I mean, while the quibbling goes on, people fall through the net. Mm -hmm. that, that's the terrible danger about mm -hmm. it. Yeah, I get that. I kind of wonder, though, I, do, I, I understand why people would make in their heads the connection between examples of like Liam Fee and named person because they're obviously going to think there is some, th some element of the named person's legislation which is to do with not stopping cases like that completely because you can never do that, but I guess it's to do with joining the dots. Yeah. It, is it, that it, true? It, it's a real challenge to turn this stuff into legislation because what we've had in the past is legislation that's focused on child protection which is much more definite, you know, this, this is about serious abuse, which everybody would say had to be tackled. What, what this is part of is, is a difference of, of approach which we've had over the past few years, which says it actually has the ambition to make Scotland the best place in the world to grow up. And there's been a lot of criticism of, of the, the idea of well-being. Actually, we've made huge strides on that. To get a common definition of what it means to have a good childhood, across social work, education, police, uh, the legal system, it's a huge step forward. And to say, oh well, in the legislation it's not quite clear how you do X, well, you can't legislate for every aspect of children's upbringing. What we're trying to do is to create that sense of a good childhood is not just an absence of abuse. It's actually, we want children to have rich lives. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. That was thank a good, you. good discussion, and thank I think you. it would be good if whoever is in charge of making sure that this is explained to people starts putting this together in a way that, putting it forward in a way that people understand better yeah. than they currently do, because I think there's a wide discrepancy yeah. between the message and what people are actually yeah. hearing properly. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And we're now going to uh, welcome to the show James Michael Rogers, who's an Ayrshire singer songwriter. Um, hi, James. I am. I'm quite glad to see you having an acoustic guitar there. I went, uh, <laughs> I went, to, electric, well, I went to see Neil Young um, at the Hydro. Uh, uh, you're week. showing your age. I am. <laughs> sure, I know. I know. I know. Yeah, yeah, no, he, he, well, it was, it was great. The acoustic stuff was great. The electric guitar, you know, his solos. I, I have a granddaughter, and I think she went through secondary school, went to university, and there's kids in the space of one of his guitar solos. <laughs> 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 Unbelievably long. <laughs> so. You, yeah, of course, will not do that with an acoustic guitar. Thank you very much. <laughs> what is it you're going to for us today? Uh, I'm going to do a song called Land of the Week. I wrote it just before the referendum and stuff. Don't know if it's exactly about that, but it's influenced by it. Thank you. Now this is a song that is hard to be written with the troubles of this time a poetic kind bitten they are bitter and God is a weapon I'm from the land of the wind now machines crush your soul we sing our songs from the rich comes the sun The scrolls into none Shimmer is all after the beats are done Oh, I'm from the land of the wheel Now it's true what they say Dead man would raise the roof in the dust. It was the world crashed down on us. I want a better life for most. Keep your holy desperate ghost. Nothing but the shackles of truth. Freedom's not a 
Why, I know it's my demand, it's mine. Nothing but check is the truth. Oh, I find the land of the week. Guess I'm from the land of the week. James at the end of the show. Um, next, uh, our next guest is Greg Russell, who's a journalist from the National. Um, Greg, welcome to the show. Greg has been reporting extensively on the situation facing the Brain family, who live in Dingwall. So the situation is they came here as part of the Jack McConnell's push to bring people to Scotland. Is that correct? It is. It was a, a push to repopulate the Highlands, which we all know is dwindling, dwindling population. And they, uh, they did their homework. It took about 10 years for them to, to actually come over here. In 2010, they received their visa in Australia. And in 2011, they started to, their furniture was in, in transit, and they started to come over. Now, in, in that time, between 2010 and 2011, um, the, the government changed the rules. So the visa they had pinned their hopes on, which was post-study work visa, which would enable Catherine, the wife, to go to university, do a degree here, and then stay on afterwards to work, that was withdrawn. So in, that was enacted in 2011. So they arrived in 2010. 2011, she she was studying at the University of the Highlands and Islands, and then she went on and did a degree with no guarantee of a visa at the end of it. And their problem is all they are asking the government to do is to uphold their part of the bargain, i.e. give them something like a post-study work visa. And, of course, they've been threatened with deportation and all sorts. This has been hanging over them for how long now? Uh, it's been hanging over them, well certainly this latest stage has been for uh, the past four months. Okay. Uh, because they were very close to deportation and they've had extensions to their time to stay, uh, largely through uh, public opinion. And uh, the work of their MP, uh, their MSP, and of course uh, Pete Wishart and Angus Robertson of the SNP at Westminster. The National brought it to a kind of wider audience, if you like, a readership, their, their, their plight. How did, how did the story first come across your radar? Well, you're old enough to remember the days when we didn't have social media in general. <laughs> yeah. can, I, can I just uh, say uh, that so now, in this programme, the second reference to my age. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping it's going to be the last. <laughs> Send it up a challenge. Facebook. Yeah, Facebook. Facebook. Social media. Uh, I read about their story on social media and got in touch with them, and uh, we, we took it from there. But in the interim, there were another four cases that were brought to my attention through social media, and I think the National has highlighted most of them. Um, they're not all exactly the same as the Brains story. Um, there's one family, the Phillips in Glasgow, he's Glaswegian. Two of his daughters have joint uh, Australian-UK citizenship. Uh, one was born in Livingston, uh, so he's got three daughters, I think it's three daughters, and his wife is Australian, and they're threatening to send her back home. It's a completely different case, but they, they all collectively highlight the mess mm -hmm. that is uh, UK immigration policy, that is tailored for one part of the country at the expense of uh, Scotland. Mm. How... the Brain family have a young son. Seven-year-old Lachlan, yeah who speaks Gaelic, I believe, unlike most of the rest of Scotland's young people. Yeah. How, how are the family coping with this stress and fear, I imagine, of, of what's going to happen next? Well, it's fear because the... I mean, I said before that Ga Lachlan's first language was Gaelic. He speaks English as well, but the whole point is that he has been educated entirely in Gaelic. I mean, he's performed at the Mott. I mean, that's a fantastic achievement for a seven-year-old kid, uh, especially one from Australia. 
and his teachers have said that it would uh, it would you know, cause him problems socially and educationally if he was sent back to an education system that wasn't in the language that he was educated in. So there are no. They're saying, yeah, if you go back to Australia, you'll be stuck into an English class, an English-speaking class, mm -hmm. and that would uh, have serious consequences for his education and for his social development. The local community and local businesses have been incredibly supportive of the family as well, haven't they? They have. They've been fantastic. Uh, I mean, there were both parents have now been offered jobs. Um, one was uh, Catherine was offered a job at the. Uh, the new Glen Withers Distillery, which is <coughs> going to be the first renewable powered community owned distillery in the world. Um, now her background in history and archaeology, Scottish history and archaeology, um, is perfectly tailored for the job, which is why she was offered it. Now that would fit in with visa requirements. Greg, her husband, who is, uh, has a health and safety background, he's also been offered a job but uh, that doesn't fall within the tight limits for uh, visa requirements. So uh, they're at uh, this situation just now where they've consulted a lawyer in Glasgow. He's taking up the case with a view to getting a, an application for a visa in before they're due to be deported or they're due to leave on the 1st of August. And it's, it's trying to cram three months' work into four weeks which is uh, quite difficult for them. So where, where are we now in terms of they're, they're told they have to leave, yes. there's been a stay of execution, if that's the right word, um, for the House of Commons to look at it, what more, I'm not sure well, quite what this delay is supposed to achieve. The, the delay, they've been told that they can stay until the 1st of August, but in that time they're not allowed to work. The, the government, the Home Office, has taken away their right to work. So they had been perfectly self-sufficient up until then. Now, all the time here, they had been working, and they were told three months ago they couldn't work. Uh, they, the, their savings had been depleted. But they invested over £200,000 to come here as part of an initiative that was going to be a benefit to Scotland and benefit to them, especially their, their child. Uh, the position we're in just now, is that they've got the stay of execution. They can't work, but they can submit another application. And it's bizarre. Uh, the James Brokenshaw, who's the immigration minister, I mean, he's been um, widely, uh, widely quoted on it, but, uh, but he's been chased by MPs and MSPs, and uh, he seems not to be moving. I mean, Theresa May isn't moving either, and she's the Home Secretary, who is ultimately responsible. I mean, I remember that Jack McCall initiative because at the time it was lauded as, as yeah. something which Scotland absolutely knew. You, you remember that, yes. and Mar Marianne, you, yeah, you yeah, covered yeah. it as well. I mean, yeah, yeah. What, what was your, what, what's your take about the, the need to get more people to come and live in Scotland? Oh well, yeah, there absolutely is, and there was a means for us to do that, and that was to vote yes in the referendum. And so it frustrates me slightly when I see no voting parties say oh this is terrible this is terrible you have to make special rules for us well no we had our chance and we, we decided not to mm -hmm. because that was one of the things during the referendum that i thought was very interesting that, that we would have an opportunity to have our own immigration policy which would allow us to bring in the sort of people we need into these areas but what, what i would also say um, in my knowledge of the home office and certainly when i worked in london they don't care that this is of no use to us. They don't care. Why would Theresa May care? Because she has her focus on Brexit, as does James Brokenshire. Why would they care? Yeah, indeed. It's of no it's of no consequence. And so no matter how much anybody bangs at any drum at the moment, they will not care. Because immigration, of course, Susan, is a big thing in the whole European referendum debate. Yeah, I mean the biggest thing certainly from Lee's yeah. perspective, isn't it? And you know, it's, it's crazy when you hear stories like this, you know, and you just think, how can this be possible? You know, that well-educated people who have like a massively positive impact on Scotland are getting forced to leave against their will. And, you know, it just makes you think how broken the system is that this can happen. I mean, I think, I think as, as Greg said, it, it's, it's an indication of just how crazy the whole immigration policy is. I mean, you know, the loopholes, the, the, the disconnects that are going on. I mean, if I can ask as well, and I know that some of the newspapers have said, well, you know, 
in the case of the Brain family, what if it had been a different kind of family? What if it had been a, a black family or an Asian family or a, a family from a different background? Would there have been the same public sympathy and, and outcry as there has been over the brains who, who fit a sort of template, um, although I, I'm fully supportive of them, it's, they fit a certain template that is easier to kind of accept, if you like. Well, well we at the National have highlighted another story uh, concerning um, a man who's, who's black, uh, who's been here for years. He is a mental health nurse. I, I, I'm not handling that one myself. That's uh, one of my colleagues. But uh, there was a huge amount of sympathy for him because he was refused um, a, you know, an extension because he had done voluntary work. Now, for the Red Cross, uh, I think yes, it was. For the Red Cross. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which which is, was used against him. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's bizarre. Um, you, you couldn't make it up. But I think it has, you know, the, the very fact that you know, questions were asked about this this is, this is the acceptable family and, you know, there may be less acceptable families or whatever, again, exposes the, the kind of attitudes that are prevalent, I think, you know, with, when it comes to immigration. It's not just about the nuts and bolts of the policy and the mechanics, it's about the culture of it as well. Yeah. Who's acceptable, who's unacceptable, who makes us feel uncomfortable and, and those that we think are, well, they're like us, therefore they're more acceptable. I think it, it's cast quite a light on that, that, that whole cultural dimension of immigration as well. It also has a, a business impact, the wider um, implication of the abolition of the post-study work visa has yeah. impacted businesses and it's impacted the economy. We have incredibly intelligent people aspiring to come to Scotland and study here and then stay on and work. And we're losing all that talent because somebody's decided that, you know, it's bad for immigration. I mean, I think as well, I get your point about them being a, a a template, if you like, yes. for. But equally, sometimes there are cases where which are just defy logic in such mm -hmm. an amazing way that it is the, it makes an unarguable case for changing rules. And I think their case is maybe one of them. And that it's, I mean, they 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 came as a response to a plea by the Scottish government to come to yes. Scotland. They came, they made their life here as they were asked to do. They made a real contribution to the local community, and now. <laughs> being told, well, thanks for well, that. It, it, you know, it, it's, it, it does defy logic and, and it does indicate or suggest that there needs to be a change in policy and there needs to be a change in the legislation. But you know, you can understand, or when I say understand, you can see from you know the UK government's perspective that they're worried about benchmarks here and precedents and goodness knows what and what route that will lead them down, not least at this precise point in time where we're looking at potentially stepping out of the European yeah. bridge, you know. So there are all kinds of other political issues yanking on the strings here, I think, as well. Yeah, the thing on, on this one, though, you mentioned precedents, and the, the, there are no precedents, really. Because now the system has, has but they stopped. They don't want to set a precedent, no, is what I'm saying. No, the system has yeah. stopped, and there are very few people who are in the same position as this family who came over here as it was changing over. So, mm, yeah. I mean, this is the point that Greg has made mm. in all the representations he's made to various people, is that you know, there can't be any people who are in the same situation who came here for this purpose uh, with the post-study work visa at the end of it because no, that's, it's gone on for so long that uh, it's not relevant now. Okay, well thank you very much for that. We'll wait and see what happens there. Um, clearly will defy logic if we're sent home, but mm -hmm. hopefully that will not happen. We shall wait and see. Sanity will prevail. Yes, there's first time for everything. <laughs> Um, next, guest. next guest. Yes, yes. yes. Um, Michael Gray is with us today. Michael is a journalist with Common Space. He has an exclusive, very, very exciting to get your first exclusive, isn't it? Um, on the uh, Snowden leaks. It was on the National, I mean, a Common Space exclusive run in the National uh, yesterday. Um, so, basically, the story is what? Well, it starts with very impressive alliteration because it's Snowden's secret Scottish spy system. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. I, that headline was a very good headline, I thought. So, I love, yeah, I love a little bit of sort of tabloid alliteration. <laughs> yes. It's, it's the first Snowden leak to implicate Scottish authorities, um, in this case, the, the police and the government. Um, because what the Snowden leak revealed, first reported by Intercept, is this secret um, programme called Milk White 
whereby GCHQ, which is the massive UK-wide spy network, passes on metadata, so that's internet data, phone calls, tracking of people's movements, onto a wide variety of other organisations, including devolved policing groups um, and the tax authorities. Uh, so that links it directly to what was um, Strathclyde Police, as mm -hmm. Billy Briggs has followed up today, and the current um, Police Scotland organisation. What's the follow-up today? Where is where's, where's that taking It's in, in the Sunday Herald, which Billy Briggs has looked into it, um, and just links the time period, which is kind of from 2006 to 2012, um, directly to the sort of police authorities uh, in Strathclyde at the time. Um, and as I reported, this obviously raises questions for Michael Matheson, current Justice Secretary, um, for what relationship there is at the moment when it comes to police interception. And um, that's controversial because Police Scotland were found to have broken the law um, on interception when they were spying on, on journalist um, communications with sources. Indeed, I think I was a, a Sunday Mail journalist uh, looking at a murder inquiry and the, they were looking into some of the calls he made, I think. That was, that's kind of so accurate, surrounding, surrounding a murder inquiry that's right. and that went through a very long review process um, with the commissioners who are in charge of these things. Um, but obviously it raises huge questions about accountability and judicial oversight and David was mentioning the case with MI6 and torture flights and this is obviously a case about privacy and about interception of people's private communications on a vast scale and the Snowden um, leaks which were almost three years uh, to this week um, revealed obviously um, an attempt to track quote like every viable user on the internet by GCHQ um, lawyers, when they were asked to provide a list of who they had been tracking and intercepting, said they, they couldn't do so because the list would be infinite, um, which is an ast astonishing word to use. Yeah, but they haven't actually tracked. Uh, they haven't tracked all those people that could. They could do it, but they haven't. So that is our, our the scale of metadata collection has been um, in billions, right. and it would basically amounts to like all communication on people's phones, um, on internet records, on search engines. Um, so it's very likely that from that you'd have the ability to track almost any individual yeah. if you're required to do so. So what are the civil liberties campaigners saying about this? They don't like it. No. Um, so <laughs> we have that. It's, it's a sort of wide range of people who've obviously raised concerns here, both to the UK authorities and to the Scottish authorities. Um, so um, Scotland against criminalising communities, uh, liberty, um, as well as well as some people from the Open Rights Group are all asking two questions. They're asking for further information from the Scottish Government and the Justice Secretary, as well as from the UK Government. But they're also asking to start a debate here on what Scotland's place within the balance between security and liberty, um, and in terms of developing an independent policy to surveillance um, and digital security. Um, so I quoted, for instance, Alistair Davidson, who created a very good paper, research paper, on this, about how you could look at open, safe, uh, open source software, looking at encryption, um, and looking at Scotland's place in the world, where he's of the opinion that this mass surveillance approach isn't safe. In fact, that was one of the leaks this week from The Intercept as well, that there was evidence from the UK government that mass surveillance doesn't make people safer. In fact, it causes greater difficulties for the security services because they're drowning in data. There's so much data that it would be impossible to read and analyse effectively, um, which means they might well be missing clues in more appropriate cases where greater surveillance is required. This kind of balance between privacy and the need for security is something that other, most countries are struggling with currently. Well, it's because we live in very, very strange times. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and, and I, well, I, I'm totally, you know, uh, in agreement with the, the kind of implications here for, for civil liberties. I'm also very conscious of the fact, I mean, you've, I know people in the security service, you talk to people in the security services, you know, they're frustrated themselves for a whole different set of reasons here, you know, and a lot of what is done, I think, a lot of the stuff that's, that's done in order to keep people safe, we never hear about, to, to be honest. I mean, we usually hear about the security services when they screw up, you know, and someone hasn't been tracked or they haven't this, that, or whatever. Um, and it's an incredibly difficult balance to get here. And, and But from a purely, I think the interesting thing you're saying is that it's from a purely practical point of view. It doesn't work for the security services this either. You know, they're, they're drowning in that data that you're talking about. There's no distillation, there's no real kind of targeting specifically of that data within within the material itself. So it's not particularly useful for them unless they have to take up some particular investigation in that way. Um, the downside of course is that it means that everyone, 
everyone has information being collected against their will, effectively. Which all sorts of private organisations are already doing, of course. Like I mean, most of well, us would indeed, be staggered, wouldn't indeed, we? Let's be honest about indeed. this. I mean, do, do, you know, they can tell us what colour of underpants we're wearing these days. I mean, I mean everybody, the, the information that's collated is phenomenal across commercially and in terms of the Absolutely. security services and whatever. I mean, what, what, do you, what do you argue? What do you say to people who say, well, you know, it's happening anyway. It's happening at a commercial level. Every time I buy something online or whatever, there's data stashed. Does it really matter then? If, if I'm not doing anything wrong, does it really matter that, that, that we're looking into it? Mean, Michael's going to have an answer to that. Well, one of the main <laughs> contexts of this whole debate is also the investigatory powers bill, the sort of cross-party Labour Tory support in Westminster, um, and the alternative being put forward by Joanna Cherry QC and the SNP was around sort of greater judicial oversight and how the warrants process works, um, and that was being put forward by various outside organisations. So I think there's definitely a reform case there mm -hmm. that maintains a balance. But what's the government, the Scottish government's view on what, what did Michael Matheson say in response to your inquiries? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you ask the Scottish government what they think, they tell you to ask the police, you ask the police and they say yeah. we do not comment on intelligence matters. But this will be raised by um, uh, John Finney, MSP, who's the Green spokesperson on, uh, he's, a, well, he's an ex-copper, and he's the Green spokesperson on justice, and he said he'll be taken up with Michael Matheson. And obviously, Matheson's in a difficult position, because I don't know what, how much power he has in relationship to the top brass in yeah. Scotland, yeah. never mind the top brass in the UK secret services. Um, which is where it's difficult to measure here, how much influence does the Scottish Government have on secret service policy? And imagine it's limited. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that ra raises, raises questions, but there's obviously an opportunity for him there. If there is any further information that the Scottish Government want to divert, divulge, um, to put it out into the public domain when Finney asks them, and it can develop the conversation. I mean, it's that lack of transparency that does trouble me. You know, that everyone just passes the buck. Don't talk about intelligence matters. We don't talk mm -hmm. about this. We don't. It's the same with the when I was mentioning earlier on about the MI6, the rendition case during the week. You know, I mean, as as, as lawyers defending, you know, and or taking up the case of, of Bill Aj and, and, and Al Sadi made the point that it's a case of you know, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, and it, it's a constant kind of barrier that we have whenever we, we talk about the security implications of this kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. And and there needs to be those political checks and balances and it's it's quite exactly. surprising that the Scottish Government have been so reticent on it to be honest. Of course but a fun source I brought into it was something called Annie Mackin who was um, an MI five whistleblower yes. and had quite a dramatic chase across Europe ages ago. Um, and it, she brought in obviously the Scottish independence dimension of you know, would the Scottish independence movement be, be viewed as a threat to the security of the state, the integrity of the UK? Um, and she brought in some light about, um, you know, there being Dundee and Glasgow MI5 bases set up uh, when she was working for the security services. Um, and her opinion was, yes, there would be some monitoring of, of the, the of independence they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't be doing the job, frankly. So I mean, yeah. if they weren't monitoring, I'm sure there's a few people in these, this room, this very room, who are well on the radar, shall, shall we say, in, in that respect, you know? Like, like you, David. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Michael, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. Um, next subject on our agenda is, of course, Europe, which is the big story of the day, of the week, probably of the year, and maybe beyond. Yeah. Um, next guest on the show is Colin Fox of the Scottish Socialist Party. Colin, welcome. Hi there. So Hi speaking you. of people on MI5, <laughs> <laughs> I, feel like last, I feel like the last guest of Jonathan Rosho. <laughs> With a headline act. Actually, I don't have a guitar. I'm Indeed. Um, what camp are you in? You I'm, I'm for remaining inside the European Union in order to change it. So okay. you can't see there's no ambition there, can you? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, where, how, how do you think, are things as you expected them to be at this stage in the game? No, absolutely not. Even two weeks ago, I'd never have put lead, uh, the lead campaign in the lead. And there's a poll in the National yesterday saying that the Leave campaign have got a 10% lead. And I find that not surprising when we read it, but it's, I think we're on the cusp of something absolutely dramatic. If that's the case, and I don't welcome it, um, I think my attitude is, is remaining inside the European Union is the lesser of two evils. That's the way I put it. I don't support remaining with any great passion. It's not socialism we're fighting for. But if there is going to be a Brexit vote, the implications are absolutely enormous. David Cameron's gone, Jeremy Corbyn's gone, be another general election this year, can forget independence referendum too. I mean, it's cataclysmic. 
And I don't know how it's going to go in the next 10 days, but I think everybody's feeling is that the momentum is with the Leave campaign. And, and really, I think the first two weeks, this was a blue-on-blue -blue conflict that left the rest of us utterly cold, watching two Tories battering each other to death with rubber hammers, and uh, frankly, we wanted both of them to lose. Now what's <laughs> happened is that the rest of the population is more engaged in it. And I think the campaign run by the Remain side has been nonsense. It's been monstrous. Cameron puts this thing through the doors, doesn't he? Remember that glossy leaflet you go? Bragging that he's come back for Europe promising that migrant labour who come to this country will not get access to the NHS or social services for four years. And he sees that as a reason for voting for Remain. The Remain case is rank. And I, I watch the debates on the television and pass, perhaps it's like partisans do. Sometimes your own side embarrasses you. You're cringing. I watched that debate on Thursday night and the three for the Remain side had me cringing. You know, the other side, Boris Johnson and Gisela Stewart and the woman for the CBI, take back control, take back control. It's like they'd learn from Saatchi and Saatchi and Goebbels. Say the same thing over and over and over and over and people will, you know, the grasp it. And the Remain side, they're all squabbling with each other. Nicholas Sturgeon saying how much she doesn't like the Tories. Great, well, bang. But that's division. The other side mm -hmm. look united, and I think that's where some of the momentum's coming from. Having said that, I said the case that you said, um, yeah, I'm in it reluctantly. Mm -hmm. It's not inspiring, is it? I said, no. oh, right, okay, so it's so reluctant. I'm, I'm going to vote for you know, maybe but somebody the, the that thing, isn't so reluctant. Yeah, the Remain case, I, I have to put it to people, and I've done lots of meetings on it, and I say, Look, the Scottish Socialist Party's attitude is that the European Union is an anti-democratic. It's not just undemocratic, it's whole structures there to prevent any kind of democratic control. It's an anti-democratic corporate club. And so people say, well, why don't you want to leave it then? Because it puts illusions in Westminster, yeah. quite frankly. You know, we have a House of Lords here, remember? We have an anti-democratic head of state <laughs> whose birthday was yesterday. We have many things wrong. The idea that somehow Brexit is a solution to everything. It's either a socialist utopia, or we automatically have a democracy, or that the corporations don't control their lives in all their you know, secret ways as well as their other ways. That's just a nonsense, that's a nonsense. And underneath the Brexit campaign, you've got this incipient racism. Foreigners are to blame for the crisis in NHS. Foreigners are to blame for the crisis in social housing in Scotland. Foreigners are to blame for our economy now going back into recession. And of course that's another myth. I find it offensive. I'm not the only one. And that's the nature of the debate, isn't it? I guess you mentioned already that the problem in, within the Remain side is that everybody looks at the Scottish independence referendum and saw the fallout from that for the parties who were enemies but yet stood together. Mm -hmm. So they're so desperate not to do that this time yeah. that they spend all their time pointing out their differences and therefore you'll have Nicola Sturgeon quite rightly in my view pointing out that the, the project fear aspects of the campaign to, to yeah. remain. But I, I think the trouble I've got with the Remain campaign is it doesn't speak to ordinary working class people in communities I live in. It's all about whether it's good for business. Well, I worry if it's good for business because businesses in Edinburgh, where I live, are responsible for zero hour contracts, an epidemic of poverty wages. So if it's good for them, look out. You know, the Remain site has not explained what's good for working class people. It needs to explain why don't we have a Europe where we have best practice from across Europe and say that's what we want for everybody. And the Remain side, and I'm sorry to keep picking holes in it, but my sister is an employment lawyer. She was responsible and very successful in getting women, local authorities across Scotland, the rights, the equal pay they've been entitled to since 1970. So the Equal Pay Act in Britain was directly a consequence of a strike by women machinists at Ford's Dagenham factory, demanding that they had pay that was equal to the skills the men had. And they won. 1970. The Equal Pay Act was passed in 1971. And now we're being told that that was somehow to do with the European Union, that we didn't join to five years later. So our history has been fed back to us to an organisation that's done some pretty criminal things. And I, and I think if this debate had been tailored at persuading working class people in Scotland, who are the majority, that it's in your best interest to stay and to change this, then we'd have probably had a different result. We'd certainly have different poll ratings, in my opinion, today. Well, who's got a positive? Who's got a positive argument for staying here? Oh no! <laughs> Nobody has. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think we we have to, as an idea, we have 
have to stand, are we or are we not on the European continent? Okay, you could say mm. that we're an island, so we're slightly aside. But if you're looking at the last hundred years of history, then you would say, I would certainly rather look to Europe and to the European ideas, to European literature, to music, to all those things, than look across the land of Atlantic to the US. And so, especially with the Trump presidency. Exactly, exactly, David. So <laughs> I, I would certainly say that's a very, a very positive thing to say that we have to stand. But I absolutely agree with you, Colin, that it, it it's not. The, the EU itself has many, many issues. And I also would say the Remain campaign that they're not being honest with folk that Europe will have to become closer together if it is to survive. It will have to have closer ties. And that will not suit what our Prime Minister thinks at all and the arguments he's making, but I think it, it, it is the truth. But there may be very good reasons why we would want to be a closer part of those things that may be slightly better for working people. Mm -hmm. um, however, all we're seeing, it, it, it's a Hobson's choice, isn't it? It, it? it really is. That's what it's looking like. Well, I, think, I think that's the dilemma. I mean, particularly for people of our kind of left disposition, you know, I mean, as I am, you know, the, the, you know, the, it is this horrible dilemma. I, I, I feel passionately European. I recognise, as you say, that, 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 that the European Union is, is a profoundly uh, flawed, anti-democratic kind of institution. Therefore, like you, I, I feel you need to stay in there and try and get that improved and make that mechanism work, you know. But we're in this, in this horrendous kind of knife edge at the moment. I mean, I mean, if, as you suggest, Colin, we are leaving here, the, the fallout from this is incalculable, really, in, in that way. And, and it, it's very difficult to see how you put Humpty Dumpty back together again in that situation. Okay. I mean, there's so many things. I mean, I, I, I'm on a wider level as well. I mean, the kind of relations between countries within Europe, you know, where that will leave yeah. us, worries me tremendously. There are security implications, you know, um, as well as trade and commercial implications as well, which I don't think have been aired properly within this debate. It's focused on one, other one thing or two is areas. Say, Richard, I'm off to Madrid next Sunday because the Spanish Spanish general election, elections, yeah. two weeks' time, and yeah. Podemos, the left wing party mm -hmm. there, have tapped into this kind of generalised anti establishment, anti corporate. You know, they're massive unemployment for young people. 55% of youngsters in Spain are unemployed. It's almost like if you're under 25 and you've got a job in Spain, you're a celebrity. And I was in Greece in 2015, again, the same kind of thing with Syriza, Europe's most left-wing government elected since the 1930s, when David was talking about earlier on. So there's a great deal of continental-wide anxiety and anger about where the, the EU is run. But what's uniform is that in virtually every group in the left that the Scottish Socialist Party is in contact with, they want us to stay, they want us to remain and work with them to shape it. And I think that's a, that's a potent part of the argument for me. But I guess everybody's got questions, but I don't know, I mean, Susan, do, do you feel that your, the questions you have have been addressed by really either side in this campaign? Do you know, I've got to say, though, the last week or so, I've stopped even listening. Because, you know, you just, like, as you say, Colin, and, like, I watched some of the debates too, it's just people shouting at each That's other, you know, and, like, doesn't tell anyone anything. And, you know, like, I have been in support of Remain, I'll vote Remain next week, but, I mean, to be honest, it's just, it's painful, a lot of it, and it's, it's boring, and, no, I mean, I don't think anybody really knows. You know, people are coming out, both sides are coming out with, you know, it'll cost you this amount of money, or it'll save you this amount of money, and... Nobody knows, you know, so then, you know, if they're coming out with these amounts of money to the exact pains, nobody believes it, because how could you ever know that? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, nobody really knows, I mean, certainly I don't know what the implications, the exact implications of staying or leaving will be. And I mean, I'm not sure anyone knows the exact implications, and I think it's just, it's just descended into a shouting match that I don't think many people are that interested in anymore. I think what we're missing is a Scottish perspective, so we're getting hit with all mm, these figures yeah. and what we don't have, for the most part, is how Scotland will be impacted if, if we leave. Greg, you and I saw a video last week showing that for every pound Scotland pays to the EU, we get £20 back, mm -hmm. which isn't a figure that's known widely, but there was there were other implications in that as yeah, well. Yeah, one of the implications that uh, the constitutional effects of England voting to leave and the rest of the UK, including Scotland, voting to stay. Mm -hmm. I mean, what happens there? Now, 
Gordon couldn't answer that, no. but I don't think anybody could. I mean, that, that throws up immense Gordon. constitutional... Gordon McIntyre, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, and he is... Yeah, it's CEO of Business for Scotland. Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, it throws up huge constitutional questions mm -hmm. that won't be easily solved. But the other thing that the, uh, the campaigns have uh, has thrown up is the people who wanted uh, an independent Scotland criticised the, uh, the other side during the independence referendum when Labour, the Tories and the Lib Dems shared a platform. Now this could come back to haunt the SNP because now we see ourselves, the SNP see themselves on the same side as the Tories mm -hmm. and Labour. And First thing I say, I think the implications are, you're absolutely right, the implications are really profound here. I mean, I think you're right, Susan, to remind us, Scotland will vote to remain. That, 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 there's no poll I've seen yet that suggests that there's a majority in Scotland no. for a leave vote. Scotland will vote to remain. The evidence would seem to be talking principally to England. But this issue about where do we then stand as supporters of independence if we find that we voted to remain, England has voted to leave and we're out. And I think one of the things that we're all grappling with here is, remember, this is going to be a victory for Boris Johnson and Farage in those circumstances. Yeah. And they are not about, I can't see them granting a second referendum to Scotland. Well, I was ask you about that, Colin, because you said a few minutes ago that you don't see it hastening a second referendum no. in, in that way. No, no. There, there are, I believe there's a lot of people out there who actually think that, it will, say this that, that it will actually hasten a second referendum. That, you know, there will be such anger, there will be such frustration that there will be a push, there will be a momentum for a second referendum. So I'm curious to, to, to hear you well, say that. For many reasons, many reasons. That's one, and it's a constitutional tie. Remember, Westminster retains the power to conduct yeah. any referendum. We don't have that yes. at Westminster. But all the evidence shows you that the majority of Scots who were most passionate about independence are nowhere near as passionate about Europe. Mm -hmm. and all right, well, I was going to ask that. are not going to win that vote. That's the trouble. It's the, the wrong issue to go to the public yeah. on. But and we the, can't afford to lose a second time. Because during the independence referendum, there were all sorts of initiatives. Right? I guess, Michael, you were involved in the National Collective, which to me was one of the most exciting. A, it got young people involved in politics. It was very, it did so in an interesting way. Uh, and it threw up all sorts of quite interesting projects and initiatives. There's nothing like that for Europe. Yeah, I think the entire referendum in Scotland has been quite a disempowering process, being it wasn't a question of the public's choosing in Scotland, it's not being argued on issues that have been dominant in the political agenda, and ultimately the vote in Scotland is very unlikely to impact the overall result. Um, so you put those factors together and you understand why people haven't been anywhere near as engaged as the referendum. And I put some of the questions that you just mentioned, Greg, to Alan Smith, the SNP MEP, about what happens in that scenario. Um, and basically there is no public strategy mm. about what the Scottish Government would do um, in that event. Everyone's talking about NDRF2. There's also just how they would conduct, the, the, well, how, what's our place within a, a Brexit negotiation. Um, would the Scottish Government consider parallel negotiations with European partners? Would they put forward a legislative consent motion to the Scottish Parliament to reject any Westminster-based attempt to remove Scotland from Europe? Westminster ultimately has the legal competency here, um, both in terms of an EU and a UK level, but Scotland would have a strong political claim, um, and have, that's why Alan Smith and sort of Scottish representatives at an EU level would have an important part to play. Are they going to make a political claim to different European partners about what type of relationship Scotland has, and um, whether Scotland can maintain any position within these European institutions? And ultimately, that would depend on whether there's a receptive audience at an EU level, and there's no public information so far on whether that could happen or what the response would be. It's, it's interesting. I, we're, we're almost the tone of the, the discussion here is almost like it's a fait accompli. You almost sense here that that people have bought into the notion that we're going to end up with a, a leave vote here. And you know, but polls are polls. I mean, yeah. well, the po bookies po have got three. Yeah, you want yeah well, 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 exactly. And, and, and the other thing as well, Richard, okay. which I think you know has to be factored in. It might not seem immediately relevant. Are other populist factors at the moment? We were talking about the football earlier on, you know, mm -hmm. the impact there. You know, relations with Europe. You know, if if the English population, the people that are inclined to leave 
are, are, are to leave Europe itself, see that the French getting heavy handed or, or this, you know, all of these things can taint. I mean, we have, you know, the, the Queen's celebration. All of these are factors, I think, that feed into the mindset of an electorate at this time. Very much and so. they could be significant Especially factors when in it's that in a life edge. When the votes are on a knife edge, these tiny little crucial, things can just crucial things one way or the other. Although the aftermath discussions have always focused on NDF2 and have always focused mm. on whether or not it's a trigger or whether if it's not a trigger does it make it more likely or does it make it less likely. I guess Michael has raised a, a, a suggestion that it, you don't, doesn't even need to go that far. Are there not, Colin, do you not, no, are, there, are, there are implications? I think, I think from Scotland's point of view, I think I'd, I would have thought we'd perfectly be reasonably entitled to say, look, we voted to remain. We're a nation, we've been dragged out against our wishes, this is something we've been in since 1975. The trouble is, the European Union don't want Scotland on its own. You've got Catalonia to think of, you've got the Spanish input, you've got Belgium's national question. So these governments and the EU as an institution are not going to touch Scotland in the first place. At the same time, you've got new agitation in Denmark, for instance, from the Danish People's Party to have their own Brexit vote, um, oh, yeah, their own yeah, leave yeah, vote. Yeah, so there's, yeah. uh, there would be a new dynamic at play, which Even is, France, would, other, a would, would, would there rather be right-wing or populist mm -hmm. movements to leave the EU? And Scotland being retained within the EU would be a coup for the kind of EU institutions and the establishment because it would be a sign that the UK basically couldn't successfully go through a, a Brexit process without obviously there being constitutional consequences. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Very interesting times. No, no, what do you thought you'd use with this uh, well, <laughs> I have to say, two weeks ago, I would have thought that would have been absolutely impossible. Oh, that's, that's it. But yeah, yeah we, we'll wait and see what happens, and we shall no doubt return to the topic, the topic next week. So that is the end of today's show. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our guests. Thank you to you for watching, and we're going to play it with some more music. Yeah, from um, James Michael Rogers again. Welcome back. Thank what are you playing for us this time? I'm going to play a new song. Uh, so hopefully I can play it okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will. It's called Closer Join to Me. Called, sorry? Closer to Me. Closer to Me. <laughs> when we talk about it all, memories they catch me by surprise. There are some I forget until I look in your eyes. Closer to you I am closer to me Now we're apart Together only by the heart And I feel okay in knowing But it's just a month of I've been going crazy, chaos, magic in my shoes. Glasgow ain't no good for an only son who is misunderstood. Closer to you, I am closer to me. Closer